In March of 2003, George W. Bush started a war. Although he declared victory less than six weeks later, that war is now into its second year. This war is not a war for freedom and liberation. It is an unjust war being waged by greedy men and sold to the public with lies. News clips reveal the truth about the war against Iraq, those who wage it, and those who promote it. This is a montage of clips from the TV news coverage of the opening major combat phase of the war in Iraq. In spite of their best efforts to hide the facts, sometimes the truth just slips out. That's why months later we went to the Security Council to get another resolution called 1441, which was unanimously approved by the Security Council demanding that Saddam Hussein disarm. I, uh, I, I, I'm hopeful that he does disarm. But in the name of peace and the security of our people, if he won't do so voluntarily, we will disarm him. And other nations will join him, join us in disarming him. you speak for the president we have no access to him can you categorically deny that the United States will take over the oil fields when we win this war which is apparently obvious and you you're on your way and I don't think you doubt your victory oil is it about oil well, no and of course it is important that we make sure that Iraq has its weapons of mass destruction removed. That is the objective of our campaign. Uh, there is no doubt that the regime of Saddam Hussein possesses weapons of mass destruction. Um, and, uh, at, uh, uh, and, and as this operation continues, uh, those weapons will be identified, found, uh, along with the people who have uh, produced them and who guard them. And uh, of course, there is, uh, there is no doubt. Well, there is no question that we have evidence and information that Iraq has weapons of mass destruction, biological and chemical particularly. This was the reason that the president felt so strongly that we needed to take military action to disarm Saddam Hussein. Saddam Hussein uh, is maintaining a, a, an arsenal of anthrax and smallpox and sarin gas. I think the question is rather simple. We either wait and see if these weapons were going to be used against Americans in an attack that would dwarf the horror of September the 11th, or we take action and make sure they cannot be used against Americans? Well, no, I think what this is is, um, uh, is a coalition force that is, uh, uh, that is designed to take down this regime and to control the weapons of mass destruction, uh, which for certain, sure, exist within Iraq. Dan, U.S. officials say the Iraqis have drawn a red line on the map around Baghdad, and once American troops cross it, the Republican guards are authorized to use chemical weapons. Uh, I think as we get closer to Baghdad, the odds just go up that we're likely to see the Iraqis use chemical weapons. We were almost all wrong. And I certainly include myself here. Uh, Senator Kennedy knows very directly. Senator Kennedy and I talked on several occasions prior to the war that my view was that the best evidence that I had seen was that Iraq indeed had weapons of mass destruction. I would also point out that many governments that chose not to support this war, certainly the French President Chirac, as I recall, in April of uh, last year, referred to Iraq's possession of WMD. The German Certainly, the intelligence service believed that there were WMD. It turns out uh, we were all wrong, probably, in my judgment. And that is most disturbing. If we uh, were able to get Saddam, should we kill him or bring him to an international court? Well, it, uh, it would be better if he got killed. And the Washington Post is reporting that the war on Iraq actually started seven hours before President Bush's ultimatum ran out. Well, that's right. I think the whole world was expecting the, the shock and awe 
massive attack mm -hmm. and instead it kind of went off half cock almost. Um, I mean, apparently this was the result of uh, intelligence. Uh, one has to ask what th those missiles actually hit, however. Plainly, uh, it appears they did not hit Saddam Hussein, although he was apparently part of the suspected target. If it is true, as one report said, that Saddam Hussein and the leadership were in a private residence in Baghdad, one wonders what happened to the family, perhaps, that live in that residence. of five million people. We can only imagine what uh, terrifying state most of those people are presumably in right now. There's a wave of war going to wash over them very soon, uh, uh, Lester. A lot of them won't do anything but sit at home with their kids and pray that it will be. But in fact, we have a family here that we visit that I've known for years, and, and, and a man who, who's a, basically a sweeper at a local mosque. He's got the six children, mainly really attractive daughters, and a 14-year-old. He was telling us that the other night, the night before last, she, she sat up reading the Quran all night because there was a series of bombings relatively distant that it seemed to shake their little poor dwelling. And he said she read the Quran from beginning to end. She'd never done that kind of effort before, and that is a big book. But that's the kind of thinking people have here. They're frightened. They turn to their religion. These people just sat in the stairwell all night because they thought it was safer there. I think there's a lot of other people in Baghdad reading the Quran and sheltering and what they think are the safest places of the house, uh, Lester. downtown Baghdad you see there an emergency vehicle responding uh, to the fire I don't know how well advised uh, that would be right now between volleys but uh, And meanwhile, the population of Baghdad continue to live in absolute fear and terror. Newspaper salesman is quoted saying that he's been selling papers in the same Baghdad spot for 13 years now, and no bombs are going to stop him. Okay, uh, I am an American of an Iraqi heritage, mm -hmm. and I live here, all my family are back home. To all the people that are calling and saying they are in favor of this war, I just want to let them rem remind them of one thing. When we had the 9-11, the bombing that happened at the World Trade Center, mm -hmm. did that unite the entire country? Did we all feel how horrible that act was? Can you please take that moment and remember for a second that there are Iraqi children, which me and my family here, me and my brother and sister over here, we are watching 
Children are being slaughtered. Yesterday in the shopping center, 55 Iraqi women and children died. Caller, where are your family members now? My family are back home. I have brothers. I have sisters. Mm -hmm. We have been unable to get a hold of them. Mm -hmm. I mean, I cannot tell you. My mom, we brought her here because we did not. We knew that war was coming. We did not want her to say she's over 70 years old. But, you know, I mean, can you think for a moment? Can you think of those children? All I hear about, we hear about President Bush. I hear about mm -hmm. Saddam Hussein. How about those people of Iraq? Are you liberating them all the way to heaven? Is that the liberation of the people of Iraq by bombing them? Do you know for the past five days they dropped more bombs than they dropped in the entire time on Hiroshima? Do you know that? Do you still support that war? I fear for the people over here and, and you know, what the anti-American sentiment. I have four girls. They were all born here within the United States because we wanted the freedom, yes. But on the other hand, uh, is this what we're doing? Is this the way we're liberating the people of Iraq? Is this rational? I mean, since Bush came, it was started with his father. A million and a half Iraqi people died because of the sanctions that were imposed during the first Bush. Now, what's happening is another killing, another murder of those Iraqi people. And everybody's wondering, why are the people of Iraq resisting? Let me tell you why they're resisting. They're resisting because they, a million and a half Iraqi people have died in the past 12 years. I, I look at CNN. I look at MSNBC. I don't see anything. I, I don't see the children of Iraq being shown. All I see is the propaganda for the war. Could you please wake up and question this government? Question President Bush. They're saying there are mass surrenders and very little command and control. Uh, Secretary Rumsfeld, of course, did talk about being in communication with uh, uh, troops throughout the various units of the Iraqi military, whether it's the uh, 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 Republican Guard or the uh, elite Republican Guard or the, the, re the regular soldiers and, and about the mass surrenders at this point. So, uh, so far, all is well from here at the Pentagon, but they are... Uh, expecting there will be some resistance at some point. Uh, that a lot of their soldiers welcome American troops. They're, they're surrendering gleefully, happily, and, and they'll be treated well. And our, our further advice would be to surrender, to save your country. There is no reason why the place should be torn up by Iraqis. We're going to have to live there. Yes, it's true. We dropped 25 million leaflets on those units to get them to surrender. But what you're seeing now are routinely report after report of hundreds of Iraqi uh, re uh, Republican Guard, uh, irregular forces, and even regular army forces who are uh, contesting, that is, trying to use their weapons to kill our uh, ground troops. That means these psychological operations, we just shouldn't put much stock in them. And in terms of the defecting, you said that uh, there aren't the large numbers, at least that uh, you had thought there would be. Any explanation in, in your mind as to why? Uh, because there are some defectors, but uh, uh, and there's going to be a Very huge few, debate. Actually. But uh, what, well, what's I your think, thought on that? Well, they are not defending Saddam Hussein. They are defending their country. Now we've heard that uh, that uh, the. Uh, Ground forces have encountered resistance in the area around Basra, and there had been some hopes that Basra would fall rather quickly. What kind of Iraqi forces are down there? Are there, are there elite Republican Guard units down there, or is this the, uh, the much derided regular army that's down there? This is the much derided regular army, three and four corps. And they are putting guns in, uh, in, on people's heads, the Iraqi citizens, uh, to uh, force them to continue uh, to fight when they'd much rather uh, give up. At the bus station on the outskirts of Amman, Zuhair and his friends are getting ready to head to Baghdad. Eight dollars buys a bus ride to the border, back to the country they left years ago. They are going, they say, to fight. The war started and we have no choice, says Zuhair. No one is forcing us, but we have to go. Every day since the war began, hundreds of mostly young Iraqi men have shown up here, ready to brave that perilous drive. Nearly 6,000 have crossed so far. It is a question, they say, of their homeland.
But the passion with which they spoke about going back in, the passion with which they feel that this is an invasion of their country, uh, that anger at the U.S. trumps their anger and their fear and their hatred of Saddam Hussein. And don't forget, they all left Iraq because they hated Saddam, because he was repressing them, uh, threatening their families. And they're not going back in because they're threatened with anything. They're going back in because they choose to go back in. No way to get around. confident our leadership always is really confident because we are defending our country we are aggressing against nobody the others are aggressing against us we are in our country we are in our homes and we will defend our country the best way and what many people tell us here and this is clearly something that the government appeals to trying even if it cannot appeal to people to support it because it is the government and president Saddam Hussein is the leader to fight because the country is being invaded. That very simple notion that Iraq is a nation and that the people of this nation should defend themselves from attackers regardless of who is the head of the nation. That is something we've been hearing in speeches. And it is something we hear from people when we talk to them privately away from cameras where they will say, perhaps we don't want this leader, perhaps we could have another leader, but our country is being invaded it is our duty to defend the country. People here we've talked to talk about defending their homes and their houses. The pictures we see on television in the evening has been of urban training for urban warfare. There is not one city where you can go in and say, here's some food, you starving people. And by the way, can we check for chemical or bio weapons? Yeah. Because we're moving forward, because so many civilians have decided to fight. Could it be that the president was not briefed on or made aware of the possibility of these uh, Fedayeen uh, the roving, almost armed townspeople? Their tactics may, may, be, may be lacking, but their, their persistence and their fortitude is not. Uh, a few days ago, when, when we were uh, caught in what was supposed to be an ambush, uh, these guys were receiving heavy fire from these HE rounds from from our, our LAV-25, high explosive rounds from a 25 millimeter a Bushmaster chain gun that was uh, literally tearing people apart when it hit them. And when I say that, I mean it. You get hit by one of those HE rounds and you basically disappear. And this was happening, uh, and the other Iraqis didn't run and hide. They continued to push forward or parallel to the troops and find new fighting positions. Um, they, were, they were popping up and down from behind sand dunes and continuing to fire on the Marines with, in many cases, small arms. They did have RPGs, they did have mortars, and um, these Marines were getting them in their sights and seeing them scrambling to try and set up equipment to possibly uh, try and take out a Marine vehicle, and the Marines were, were, were killing these people. But they weren't stopping. They were continuing to fight back um, until they basically decimated whatever forces were out there uh, and, and then, at some point, they did stop fighting. But it was a 45 minutes to an hour, uh, and uh, there were no Marine casualties, uh, no, Marine, uh, no Marine vehicles um, uh, were damaged, uh, but there were a number of Iraqi vehicles destroyed and dozens of Iraqi uh, fighters killed. So uh, I think that was one of the big things we, that the Marines took out of that battle was um, these guys uh, didn't just drop and run, they, they continue to fight and continue to advance on the Marines even as their, uh, their fellow fighters are being taken out. That's incredible, Rick. And how does your commander explain their tenacity? Is it possible that it's more than that? Does the president have any judgment as to whether uh, these aren't just soldiers who are being terrorized to fight? And not just essentially gangsters who are loyal to Saddam, but these are Iraqis who believe they are acting as patriots defending their country from an invasion. Whatever numbers they may be, whatever numbers they may be, they are insufficient for the American military. So there are no Iraqi nationalists, not Saddam loyalists, not terrorists, but no ordinary Iraqi nationalists who are fighting for their nation. It's only, in the president's judgment, fanatics, dead-enders, as, as Secretary Rumsfeld said, yeah. fighting solely Terry, I don't know that it's my job to psychoanalyze the Iraqi military. Automatically, they came with a posture. Uh, we let off the first burst, and automatically, they started returning fire towards us. And then, of course, it escalated rapidly. We had tanks here. We had, ultimately, airstrikes. This went from being 
what was a, a smallish skirmish, I guess, at the beginning, to a full-scale, four-hour-long battle. Uh, yes, it did. I mean, um, we have un unconfirmed reports of uh, different uh, Iraqi officers stating that uh, troop strength. I mean, all of that is unconfirmed. I'm sure as this unfolds, uh, the picture will become a lot clearer of what exactly was in there and who was operating in there. Uh, but it did. It rapidly escalated into, uh, from a, like you said, from a skirmish into a full-scale battle. You will know better than most that um, when the plans were drawn up, drawn up for this conflict against Iraq, the idea was for you guys from the 15 Mu to get into Umm Qasar and get out in a matter of hours. We're now moving into to day three. These guys are slowing you up, aren't they? Well, no, actually, the original plan was us to roll into Umm Qasar, and we were to be here from anywhere from a four to eight hour uh, period, or as you were, a four uh, to eight hour uh, uh, span of days. People are clearly fighting for their country as we would fight for this country. Uh, there's, there's always concern. Uh, we're not in, uh, we're not back in the states. Uh, we are uh, in someone else's land. So there's always concern 24-7 uh, here. I would not want to be a Marine second lieutenant as a part of an occupying force in Iraq for very long because there are a lot of Iraqi patriots that are going to think it necessary to take out an occupying army from any country, but particularly us. George Bush, take a good look at this man. Because you took my only son away from me. Now, one of the things that the United States had said in their best case scenario would be that everywhere the Americans would show up, they would be greeting the Americans as liberators. And also, in terms of the military, that there would be massive defections. We haven't seen the surrenders and defections that were seen in 1991. In fact, uh, some uh, supposed uh, people waving the white flag, in fact, ambushed American soldiers. And although there have been some instances of groups of people thanking the Americans, praising the Americans, again, uh, not widespread welcoming of American soldiers. We keep hearing about a variety of things that are being called dirty tricks. For example, uh, the Fedayeen, <clears throat> underneath they have uh, regular army uniforms, they have Bedouin clothes on top of them. I is this anything the coalition should not have been expecting? Uh, they certainly should have been expecting it. Uh, and I worry a little bit right now when I hear comments like I heard out of the, uh, the CENTCOM briefing this morning uh, talking about the suicide bombing that he said, well, this is an organization that, that seems incredibly desperate. I think that's exactly wrong. I think back to the original Rocky movie in which uh, he said, hey, champ, he doesn't know it's a show. He thinks it's a fight. These guys think this is a fight, and they will do most anything to go ahead and fight on terms which simply don't accept the rules as they think the U.S. has laid them down. They have the option of making their own rules, and they're going to do that foul or fair. But the way things went down, everything was very smooth for the Navy SEALs and their boat crews when they got out there. They faced hardly any opposition whatsoever. These people who were on these terminals were quickly subdued. And now those very important oil lifelines for Iraq are safely in American hands. The air campaign is achieving its objective, and the ground campaign is uh, also achieving objectives. We're, uh, we're slowly but surely uh, taking control of that country so that we can free the people of Iraq and uh, eventually clear that country of weapons of mass destruction. We've made good progress. One of the big concerns early on was the southern oil fields. As you all remember, we had discussions about that. There was a lot of speculation about whether or not coalition forces would be able to get to the southern oil fields in time before, uh, so that Saddam Hussein wouldn't destroy them. As a matter of fact, uh, I had frequently talked about the southern oil fields or oil fields in general in my uh, declaratory policy. Uh, Tommy Franks put a plan in place that moved on those oil fields quickly and at least in the south they are secure and that is positive news for uh, for all of us. Operation Iraqi Freedom they were gonna call it Operation Iraqi Liberation then they realized uh oh that spells oil. <laughs> Yeah, they do have control of all the oil feeds, fields across southern Iraq. There is still some question of control of the oil fields in the north, but those paratroopers who landed in northern Iraq last night will uh, move to get control of the oil fields. Well, first of all, the successes are important to note, namely the coverage of the territory rapidly has secured at least 60% of the oil wells, which are in the southern part of the country, 
only seven fires out of 500 wells is remarkable, uh, given what was predicted. While the civilian apparatus reemerges, the military administers things, and to follow Helen's very interesting line of question, would that include the oil field? Uh, the military would be there to provide for the physical security for as long as that was required to create that atmosphere throughout Iraq so that peace could emerge. And we would work with the civilian authorities both inside and outside during a period of what would be obvious overlap. So right now the civilian authorities who uh, administer the oil fields for the Iraqi people, which you say you're interested in, is the UN Oil for Food it, it organization. It has modalities of contracts and accounts and things like that. It's the administration pledging that the oil fields will continue to be run under that system for the benefit of the Iraqi people as it is now. The, the future would be administered, as I mentioned, by a number of agencies, including international. At the opening of our Operation Iraqi Freedom, special forces helped to secure airfields, bridges, and oil fields. Some of the first things that our troops are going to be doing is to be trying to get the weapons of mass destruction, also trying to secure the oil fields, and then eventually making their way to Baghdad. Such a busy day. Look at the neighborhood that these men and women are working in. Uh, you know, Afghanistan there. Uh, it's been the, uh, you know, the ping pong ball of the great powers. You got Pakistan with all the, you know, for all of the uh, good work being done by President Musharraf. You've got uh, great, uh, uh, great problems and turmoil there. Uh, then you go to Iran, uh, you know, designated by the president, one of the, uh, the axis of, uh, of evil. Uh, hopefully those stray cruise missiles won't give them an incentive to cause even more uh, trouble and chaos uh, than they might uh, or ordinarily. And then you've got Iraq. It's right there. It's just a hop, skip, and a jump away. And imagine if we didn't win, if we weren't suppressing the terrorists here in Afghanistan. Look at that band, that belt of absolute threat to freedom-loving people everywhere. You know, I just wish that the anti-war demonstrators would just pull out their atlas one day and take a look at the map. Look at this potential anarchy. Look at a, a belt where governments uh, heretofore have been extremely hostile to anything that, uh, that uh, democratic-loving people uh, believe in. So, uh, you know, it really is uh, quite a mission. David, that these people uh, are, are doing for us. Uh, I want you now, if, uh, if you would, David, to bring in some of our guests, uh, get uh, you know, some uh, I'm gonna do appraisal that, of what's going on. I want to do okay. that. I also, Joe, though, just want to say, because of the work that the men and the women are doing there, the, the Army, the Marines, the Sailors, the Air Force, all of them, that belt that you talked about, which has so much dictatorial power and so many bad things about it right now, could potentially be turned into a domino of democracies. I mean, there is this potential that because of the work that the men and women did in Afghanistan, because of the work that's being done right now in Iraq, that might spread throughout the region. And what we see now as a dangerous belt may turn out to be a very profitable, very helpful belt to, to the democratic cause worldwide. Well, there's a report made for Cheney of about a year ago on what would be the future of oil uh, by 2020, and the, the summing up was that most of the world would be out of oil and natural gas, and the great reserves, the greatest reserve is Caspian oil mm -hmm. in the old Muslim republics of the former Soviet Union. And I, I see our plan, oh, I cannot say a conspiracy, because that means I believe in flying saucers, so I see a coincidence that we're moving first to Afghanistan, which is the gateway to uh, getting into Caspian oil. We're now up in there in Iraq, second largest oil reserves. I know we do everything for liberty and freedom because we're good and they're evil. <laughs> and I think the war is a positive for the fundamentals in a, in a few ways, or the, the successful completion, the most obvious one, and people don't think about this, the, the Iraqi people may own their oil, but we're gonna have a lot of influence on what they do with it, you know. And we've developed some other news here about that bombing a couple of days ago, or that explosion, should I be more specific, in that residential area in northern part of Baghdad. Officials here at the Pentagon tell Fox News that they have looked and looked and looked at all the targeting matrix, and a cruise missile would have had to gone off course by a mile or more 
might maybe even a mile and a half to actually inflict that damage. There is no belief here at the Pentagon that a cruise missile went off course by that. There is no incidents in this entire campaign of a cruise missile missing by that much. This ship launched eight Tomahawk missiles. One didn't make it too far. Its booster fell not too far from me in the water, right beside me. But seven others launched successfully, reaching targets which, of course, we don't know. One of the Tomahawks failed during or immediately after the boost phase, and we watched it fall into the sea. We later learned that another fell to the ground in Turkey. Now, because of that and the previous failure of two other TLAMs there, as well as the failure of an unknown number of cruise missiles in Saudi Arabia, those countries have asked the U.S. to hold off from future launches. Three errant missiles landed in Turkey, somewhere between 100 and 250 miles from where I'm standing. The last one landed yesterday, and when some U.S. investigators went to check it out to see what had gone wrong, they were greeted by villagers who hurled rocks and eggs at them. It was reported at this news conference a short time ago that uh, one of the Tomahawk missiles that was en route to Iraq mistakenly landed, or more than one, in Saudi Arabia. How could this happen? A U.S. missile has hit a Syrian passenger bus near the Iraqi border. Five people have been killed. This according to the Syrian news agency. Again, a U.S. missile has hit a serious Syrian bus, rather, killing five people there uh, along the border. Any casualty that occurs, any death that occurs, is the direct result of Saddam Hussein's policies. So let me go back to something you mentioned a moment ago. In your investigations, you have seen no link between al-Qaeda and Iraq, no evidence of any direct con connection. Well, you know, I met bin Laden in 97, and um, Peter Arnett, the correspondent, myself, we asked him at the end of the interview, uh, just, you know, in passing, because at the time, of course, it wasn't regarded as uh, anything that anybody would ever care about. But we asked him his opinion of Saddam Hussein. And he said, well, Saddam is a bad Muslim, and he took Kuwait for his own self-aggrandizement, which, of course, are both defensible statements. Everybody knows that Saddam's attempts to sort of dress himself up as a, as a believing Muslim are rather recent and are sort of a, a rather lame attempt to, to ga gather more support. I mean, the Ba'athist party that he runs... Uh, is a secular party. Uh, when bin Laden made that statement recently about supporting the Iraqi people, he referred to bin Laden, uh, to Saddam's party as communists and socialists. So I don't think, uh, and I don't think those are terms of endearment for bin, for bin Laden. You know, the, the best case that there was a link between al-Qaeda and Iraq was presented by Secretary Powell of the United Nations. That was the best administration case. And I think even that on close examination doesn't add up to very much. This is a war of choice, uh, more so perhaps than a war of necessity. It's a preemptive war. It's a preventive war. It's not the first time we've preempted. I would remind your viewers that, uh, that, the, that the Reagan administration preempted in Grenada. And we got a lot of criticism from people in other countries. And even, indeed, uh, Margaret Thatcher criticized us, uh, our very close ally at the time. We preempted in Panama. And there was criticism all over the world. Two days ago, when Iranian people went to the street to oppose the war, they made it extremely crystal clear that they opposed Saddam Hussein as much as they opposed the war. This war is a war that is being waged without authorization from the Security Council, without the existence of prior armed attacks. So from the point of view of international law and international legitimacy, this war is not legitimate. It cannot be legitimized. And that is why most countries on the face of the earth, most people across the globe have opposed this war and continue to oppose it. As the human suffering, as the toll of civilian lives that are lost in this war uh, tend to rise, and unfortunately this has been the case and will continue to, to be the case, I believe it will become even more clear that liberation of a people at, uh, at gunpoint is not the best prescription for bringing democracy to countries that are suffering from dictatorships. George Galloway stresses that the war against Iraq is unlawful. He further calls it an imperialistic action and a crime against humanity. Helen? Uh, can you say whether uh, yeah. Iraq is the end uh, goal here? Can you say whether Iraq is the end goal here? Some of the president's advisors have said they thought it would be good to go on to other countries in the region to democratize or liberate. What is it? Can you clarify for the American people? Who, is, who has suggested that? Uh, 
curl. Uh, yeah. What you're trying to do with a campaign like this is similar to what occurred in the Blitzkrieg. We talk about Saddam Hussein is another Hitler, Saddam Hussein is another Stalin, but here in the Arab world, that message just isn't getting out. And the, the recent attacks or missile strikes on the Baghdad market, it's amazing to read the Arabic newspapers here. And first of all, they call us invaders. And the headlines are, the United States attacks Baghdad market, kills 50 civilians. Instead of when uh, Secretary Rumsfeld referred to allied forces, they were referred to as the occupying forces. And that is a perfect, I don't know, header for what the kind, the kind of coverage that is going out on Al Jazeera and therefore in a lot of parts of the world. Yeah, and yesterday, too, Charlie Rangel, who's a, a U.S. congressman from, from New York, was on Hannity and Combs. You've been crunching that was, paper yeah, in your because hand, because I'm, so, I'm so angry, and, and I know Charlie Rangel a little bit, and he's a good congressman, but I think that, that comments like this, accusing the United States of killing Iraqi children, are really out of line in this kind of context. You know, we're trying to fight a war here. Is there anything in the British experience in Northern Ireland that is helpful in prosecuting this situation? Uh, indeed it is, and let's go further back to Northern Ireland. We've uh, got experience of counterinsurgency operations, Borneo, Malaya, Cyprus, right back through our last 30 years of military history. I find our policy in many parts of the world has been to promote uh, dictatorship, uh, often death squad dictatorship of the mur most murderous kind, and I'm speaking here now of El Salvador, Guatemala, Indonesia. I could name really quite a few other places where a policy, why? Because we like to murder people? No, but because we think the alternative, including the democratic alternative, going all the way back to Mossadegh, whom we replaced in a coup by the Shah back in 19, early 50s and later in Guatemala, we thought that the dictator was better for our interests. And that was clearly the policy that we've had in Iraq. And I would guess will continue to be our policy. I'm basing my, my pessimistic predictions uh, on the past U.S. policy, which I think is going to be extended people in Iraq, I understand, from people who are there now, do perceive Hussein as a dictator. How could they not? But as a dictator that the Americans chose for them. That's and they just find, not true. I mean, well, look, we, we have mistakes in our Iraq policy. It's just ludicrous. We didn't choose Hussein. Oh, pardon me. We didn't put him in, in 1963, power. In 1963, we didn't put him in power. In 1963, when there was a brief uprising of the Ba'ath, we supplied specifically Saddam with lists, as we did in Indonesia, lists of people to be eliminated. And since he's a murderous thug, but at that time, our murderous thug, he eliminated them. When their, his party is that came right? to the power, Kennedy that is right. That supplied, is right. Personally surplied, so personally no. surprised. Well, they should. Uh, yes, no, they shouldn't have. But it wasn't just a marginal error. Same thing went on in '68. He was our thug, just as Samosa and Noriega and a lot of other people who were on the leash until they got off the leash, and then we eliminated them, like No Dins Young. This is not a familiar notion to Americans. Not, I don't expect it's even a friendly. wild oversimplification. No, no, no. The Ba'ath no, no. Party was not a pro-American party. We were no, not happy that's with not, the Ba'ath Party. It was better, however, than the alternative was, in our view. Well, that was Why did we, why did we support Saddam as recently as when you were in the administration? And the answer is we, we, didn't we preferred... We did Saddam when I was in the administration. But pardon me. When you say that you didn't see anything really very wrong, I'm saying that some of these policies, including, by the way, backing Saddam in his murderous war against Iran, and then at other times backing Iran in its murderous counterwar against Iraq, this was American policymaking at its worst. Uh, when the... Uh, if the papers were to come out now, I think that Henry Gonzalez in Congress was beginning to get at of the degree to which both the Reagan and Bush administrations tolerated and encouraged the buildup of Saddam's chemical weapons capability, or tolerated certainly, and encouraged, if anything, uh, the funding of a nuclear weapons capability, which we were perfectly aware of during that period, after we knew of his gassing of the Iranians and gassing of the Kurds. I think the regular doc, the Pentagon Papers of that period would, I think, be very highly embarrassing. Uh, probably not to Bill Crystal, but to uh, a lot of the people who are right in this administration. Luke Herman, Canal Plus Television, Paris. How come you are still using depleted uranium rounds since we know that they are causing health problems, including cancers, to the civilian populations and to the uh, military uh, operation? Well, I think that's probably overstated. Why do you think the Iraqi TV is a military target? Because there are a lot of civilians working inside, I guess. Thank you.
We only target things that have military significance. We only target things that have military significance. It's quite clear there's a big gulf between what the Pentagon would like us to think is happening in the South and what's going on there. And this is not just from our observations, but even talking to some of the troops. Frankly, we in the media did not cover the anti-war movement as it was moving along on the Internet. We weren't focused on that. And now, uh, brilliantly, the Pentagon has accomplished the fact with embedding that we're watching the war unfold in slices. One of the biggest problems the United States has right now, we saw it last night, we went to Paris, is that we're getting hammered by almost every government in the world that we're the oppressor, we're the bad guy. Mm -hmm. Can that public perception, night after night, day after day, be changed? Well, yes, it can be. And the U.S. needs to transactionally show how the Iraqis are misusing and abusing the civilians of Iraq. When we talk about that there are, there's a tank in a hospital, or we talk about them posing as civilians or hanging out, hiding in civilian homes. We increasingly show the rest of the world how Saddam doesn't care about his own people. Okay, that's logically and, fine. And by the but way, wait, 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 wait. How do we get that out if the Al Jazeera's, the agents French, the media in Britain, even the BBC, will not report that? They flat out don't report it. So how do you get your message out? We can do it because we have a monopoly on information coming from inside Iraq. Uh, it's our troops who are with the units, our, sold, our reporters who are with the units, who are embedded, as you like to say. And if those reporters file a story that says that there was a tank in the hospital, and those reporters file a story that said the Iraqis were hiding out in Mrs. O'Leary's backyard, uh, sheltering under her and saying that don't shell because it'll be a civilian casualty. We can get that information out abroad and in the United States. Look, there are two possibilities, Bill. Either the Iraqis use poison gas and biological weapons or they don't. If they do, then all bets are off. The United States can go ahead and shoot anything it wants whenever it wants. If they don't, the U.S. has got to make the case before the siege of Baghdad that it is okay to attack areas with civilians. <laughs> We should just bring your attention to the news you can see at the bottom of your screen there. Um, coming in from sources, the Press Association and Reuters saying that British defence officials are investigating reports that four or five British soldiers have been kidnapped in Basra overnight. We have no more details than that and we are trying to get you some. And uh, of course if uh, any of our correspondents can confirm it, we will bring it to you. But we've got Michael McGinty with us uh, in the studio. He's from the Royal United Services Institute. And you were saying earlier, Michael, that the use of the word kidnapped is quite an interesting one. Well, it is. Uh, if, if the report is that soldiers have been taken and are being held hostage against a particular set of demands, then clearly that's kidnapping. Um, but it, this is in the very early stages of, of the announcement. But, but kidnapped, it, it sounds very pejorative. It really um, is, is something that goes hand in hand with the kind of language we've been seeing this week. Um, Jeff Hoon and Tony Blair have made lots of speeches um, outlining the depravity of the Iraqi regime and, and how good our conduct of the war and how bad their conduct of the war is ethically. Mm. Um, and, and we had a, a whole litany of that from uh, Jeff Hoon. I think it was the day before yesterday. and He didn't say anything else in his uh, press conference. Um, and we talk about militias and guerrillas in, again, a very pejorative sort of way. And there's a sort of use of language here, a spin, if you like, that's being put on, uh, on, on a routine event, in this case, of people being taken prisoner, prisoner which happens in every war. In referring to the suicide bombing yesterday, you, you refer to it as terrorism, um, just like a, a definition, because usually when you think of terrorism, you think of attacks against civilians, mm. the intended target was clearly military. You are in Iraq, sure. they are resisting. Sure. Are these kind of attacks not legitimate resistance? Oh, I didn't, I didn't comment at all about whether it's legitimate or not. I suppose, <clears throat> I suppose that's eye of the beholder. In fact, coalition forces did capture it and do control the port of Umm Qasar and also a growing portion of the country of Iraq. Another report that we've received in the last few moments, artillery fire being heard in the southern city of Umm Qasar. One interesting note about Umm Qasar. Yesterday, a senior executive at the BBC in London apologised to British television viewers, saying that the BBC had, over the course of the past week, nine times reported that Umm Qasar had been liberated and they were still struggling to get a handle on the exact situation there. Neil? 
Yes, Paul, what seems to have been filtering throughout the morning is that these attacks did pretty much take everyone by surprise. And as you said, very limited information. And the information that we are being given, we have to be careful that we're not being fed. <laughs> I will say this, the Geneva Convention uh, indicates that it's not permitted to uh, photograph and embarrass or humiliate uh, prisoners of war. Yesterday the Prime Minister described the execution of two British servicemen. Today we're told there's no conclusive evidence as to their fate. Indeed, senior officers have told the family that they died instantly in an ambush. In those circumstances, do you regret the hurt and distress caused to that, those families? Well, if harm has been caused, then clearly we have to regret this. That Prisoners of war have been brutalized and executed. I'm going to skip to the mirror. Okay. Uh, because it's continuing this political story about mm -hmm. whether or not uh, uh, this serviceman was executed by the Iraqis when he died in action, was, was just killed. Uh, the paper saying that uh, number 10 has issued an apology of sorts and the family saying uh, that uh, they are still very cross about that. Yes, Mr Blair said it was an execution, mm. but the uh, Ministry of Defence is saying they apologise. For Yes, they've lost one of their own. We've all lost colleagues all through this war. This is just a reminder of the price that people in our business are paying, people in the price that Iraqi civilians are paying who are caught up in this. And I'm sure that uh, one of the questions that Al Jazeera will want to know the answer to is why was that house on the river, which was so clearly marked and which was so clearly known to CENTCOM, why was that house hit today? You remember, of course, Michael, that um, Al Jazeera's offices in Afghanistan were also hit during the Afghan war. And when I was visiting with Al Jazeera officials just a few months ago, they told me that uh, they could not believe that their offices there were deliberately targeted. The Pentagon again saying that there was no deliberate targeting of the Al Jazeera and Abu Dhabi TV offices there on the riverbank. But obviously there were a lot of questions. It was a place that was known. It was a place that was well marked and a place where clearly Al Jazeera staff thought that they could work safely from. AP is reporting that uh, what you see there is the result of a tank shell from a US tank. Uh, AP had reported earlier quoting US soldiers, not really sourcing it any better than that. Uh, US soldiers had reported taking sniper fire from this hotel where the media is broadcasting by and large and, uh, and uh, had responded. Now uh, they're reporting that it was a tank shell that hit that room, uh, we're told on about the 15th floor. Reuters now reporting that four of its people have been wounded, a, a reporter, a cameraman, uh, a photographer and also a technician. British officials here, U.S. Central Command, are now saying, they're now telling NBC News uh, that this British warplane was shot down by U.S. Patriot missile battery. The soldiers from the Household Cavalry Regiment were in a column of five armoured vehicles on a reconnaissance mission north of Basra. They insist all the vehicles were clearly identifiable as belonging to coalition forces. Despite this, an American A-10 tank buster fired on them from just 50 metres, circled and then fired again. The commander of the unit survived and has criticised the pilot of the A-10 for having no regard for human life. He said, I believe he was a cowboy. He'd just gone out on a jolly. I'm curious about what's going to happen to him. He killed one of my friends. Here's the basic gist of the story. On Sunday, the Russian embassy, the remaining embassy staff in Baghdad, along with a fairly large group of Russian uh, journalists in Baghdad, made a decision to leave the city. They say that they discussed uh, escape routes out of the city extensively with U.S. officials at CENTCOM. They told uh, the U.S. that they would be traveling. It was to be a fairly large convoy. Yet when they got to the outskirts of the city, they came under fire. Now, the circumstances and what exactly happened and who was doing what to whom are still a little unclear. But the Russian ambassador to Baghdad says they confronted American armored vehicles, American tanks, and that the American forces opened fire on them. Um, Condoleezza Rice, National Security Advisor, of course, in, uh, in Moscow yesterday for meetings with the Russians. They have basically said that they are very sorry that this incident took place. 
The Americans at CENTCOM haven't been quite as forthcoming yet. They said that initially, of course, they said that they had no U.S. forces operating in the area, and now they're saying, well, perhaps there was something going on. And Basra is facing a water supply crisis, the BBC is reporting. According to the Red Cross, a humanitarian disaster is just around the corner for the southern Iraq city as water and electricity supplies there have been cut off for more than two days now. The Red Cross claims the area's water station had been destroyed in coalition airstrikes and people now have no access to a regular water supply. The Shiite population in the south has suffered tremendously under Saddam Hussein's regime. And now the war has brought new hardship. No water for these people for days. This man says that American bombing knocked out the electricity, shutting off their water pumps. And where's the humanitarian aid, he asked. And there's one imp impediment to aiding the long-suffering people of Iraq, and that is the removal of these mines. This is a real sign of what the Iraqi regime will do. They are willing to block their own ports, starve their own people, stop the humanitarian aid from getting through. All the efforts that we are making in the middle of a shooting war to feed the Iraqi people are a reflection on how the United States and our allies fight wars. What, uh, just uh, quickly again, have they found any mines, or is it just... Well, late last week, a uh, boarding patrol, an Aussie-led boarding patrol, found an Iraqi barge and Iraqi right. tug up in the KA waterway with 86 mines on them. Now, none of the mines had been deployed yet, but this raised the level of concern quite a bit on this ship. In fact, they've asked all the sailors sleeping below the waterline to move up to the hangar deck, and the ship went into a red alert yesterday where all the sailors had to wear anti-flash gear and put on hard hats. So there's, the concern's taken seriously, but there's no evidence that mines are actually in the water at this point. Prices of food and medicines have gone up, and the U.S. and British planes have destroyed a warehouse which contains 75,000 tons of food supplies. In what is being described as the fiercest land battle of the war so far, the Pentagon says the 7th Cavalry troops killed as many as 200 Iraqi soldiers near Najaf, just 95 miles south of Baghdad. We seem to underestimate the amazing firepower and overwhelming advantage we have militarily. Let me give you an example. In Mogadishu in 1993, we had 18 Americans killed, but we probably killed several thousand Somalis. Now, we didn't have air power, we didn't have armor, but the fighting power of that light force was extraordinary. The fighting power we can bring to bear is extraordinary. The larger strategic issue is, how do you take on Baghdad if there is resistance? Because that is a really difficult issue. If you take it on and you have lots of casualties, is a problem. If you have a siege, that's a problem. So the notion of waiting till you bulk up and see how this thing works out probably makes some sense. Go ahead. Well, I, you know, I, you have to begin to ask yourself, what does winning mean here? You know, I mean, if uh, if, if we kill 3,000 Somalis with uh, Task Force Ranger, which is just a tiny little infantry outfit with a few helicopters, you know, and we go into Baghdad, fight our way into downtown Baghdad to evict the regime, you know, how many Iraqis are we going to kill? What's that going to do to our position in the world in the future and in the Arab world, Islamic world especially? You have to start to ask yourself, well, what, what, is, what does winning mean in this case? I think they'll never publicly admit to changing the rules of engagement. I think they might change the interpretation of those rules of engagement in the field. There are ways of doing it without quite doing it. Uh, I think we're still a long way from carpet bombing. The first war plan has failed because of Iraqi resistance. Now they're trying to write another war plan. I think 